This morning, I want to talk to you about what we covered Wednesday. I got done teaching on God is a Redeemer in Genesis chapter 3, and you might want to turn there to Genesis chapter 3, because that's where we're going to be for the majority of the morning. The title of my message this morning is The Fall. The Fall. got done teaching this and got home and was thinking about this morning and and I really just felt in my spirit the Lord say no you need to redo this on Sunday morning and so to give you a little sample of what we do on Wednesdays because we're doing a series out of the book of Genesis right now both in, in the sanctuary and in the youth we're working on the same stuff um, I thought I'd bring a little a little of our Wednesday night teaching in on Sunday morning for you. So this morning I want to talk to you about the fall, and it's in Genesis chapter 3. And it reads, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said to you, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that the day you eat, uh, excuse me, for God knows that the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband with her and he ate. <clears throat> Verse seven, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together to cover them, uh, to make themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord called to Adam and, he, and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I've commanded you that you should not eat? And then the man said, The woman who you gave to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you've done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your, and, your and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then, Adam, then, then to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree, which I have commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles. It shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb and the, of the field, and the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And Adam said to his wife, uh, excuse me, and Adam called his wife Eve, her name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Verse 21, also for Adam, 
and his wife, the Lord made tunics of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, man has come to us to know good and evil, and now lest he put his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Verse 24, so he drove out the man and he placed a cherubim in the east of the garden of Eden with a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way into the tree of life. Let's pray. Lord, I just come to you this morning and I ask that you would just help me teach and preach this message under your anointing, Lord. And Father, give us ears to hear and an understanding heart. In Jesus' name, amen. If we could, can you show me the picture right there? Now, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but you can see the lower circle. These are the two locations, the lower and the upper. These are the two locations in where they think the Garden of Eden might have been. The lower circle is down near uh, Persia. The upper circle is up near Mount Ararat. So it's in those two general vicinities that they feel like maybe the Garden of Eden was, okay? So as we begin to take a look at this, we take a look at the fall. And what do we have first? We have the temptation. So my first point would be the fall, temptation. Now the serpent, the Bible says, was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat of the tree of the garden in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1? You see, it's amazing because the minute the serpent enters the picture, what does he immediately do? He immediately begins to deceive. He immediately begins to get you to second guess the voice of the Lord. You see, there are times, and even this morning, the altar call, I could feel God saying, I want to set some people free. We had tongues, and I, I know the Lord gave me the interpretation of those tongues. And I heard the Lord as I was standing here saying, and I was, I was wooing you. And I was telling you what I felt the Spirit of the Lord was saying to me. And, and, and there's, there's things that we walk in that bind us up and hold us down. And God is saying, I want to set you free from whatever that is. Let me ask you a question this morning. How many came this morning with some woes or some worries or some heaviness on you? Let me see your hands. Okay, so here we go once again. <laughs> How many came and there's some anxiety? There, there's some things that you're facing. Maybe it's a son or a daughter. Let's get this thing broad because as parents, you know, we carry that with our kids, even though they may be grown that I, you know, I'm not there yet. But I hear a lot of parents with grown children and you're constantly praying and you're constantly going before the kingdom of heaven on behalf of your children. How many have got some situations like that? Let me see your hands. And you're like, listen, God, we really need some breakthrough to take place. Truth be told, I think everybody would raise their hand, but that's not the point. The point is, is the Lord was here this morning, and I truly believe that the Lord was speaking to some people this morning, saying, listen, I know this is going to be difficult for you to do, but I'm taking over if you'll let me. And you might have been sitting there saying, I'm not sure if I can let you or not, God. Come on, am I just being real? I mean, how many times have you ever said that, right? We're just being real here this morning. And the Lord's like, but I can do a much better job. I can do a much better job. The devil has been trying to deceive man since the beginning. You know what the devil's been trying to do? He has been trying to take that word that he has placed in your spirit and he has tried to remove that word from you. Listen to what he says to Eve right here. He said, did God really say you must not eat? You know what he is doing? He is making her, he is called challenging her to question the word of God. Ever since then, we have been questioning the word of God. 
Every since then, we have questioned, was that God or was that me? Was that God or was that me? Friend, let me tell you something. When God is in the house and he is saying, I am right here, turn it over to me. Let's just give him the benefit of the doubt on that one. Can we say amen? Let's just give him the benefit of the doubt and let's just turn it over to him and say, God, I believe you can handle this better than me. Sometimes we, we don't have any problems turning all this stuff over. To, but there's always these little things that we just, we won't yield because we think we can do it better. I don't know, maybe it was part of our upbringing that makes us think that way. Or maybe it's just our stubbornness. Not that there's anybody stubborn in this. I, didn't, I wasn't implying y'all, okay? <laughs> wasn't doing that. But right here we see the temptation that comes in from the devil. He comes in in the form of a serpent. Satan enters into God's good creation with very bad intentions. Let me say that again. God, uh, Satan uh, enters into God's good creations with very bad in uh, intentions to make God's image bearers disobey him. You know, God said, let's make man, let's make him in our image. This is a lesson we covered a week ago. We are the image bearers of God. Look at your neighbor and say, you're the image bearer of God. Go ahead, look at your neighbor and say, you're the image bearer of God. Look at your neighbor and say, I am the image bearer of God. Go ahead, make that personal. I know, I know, it's a little difficult. Some of you just hanging your head. But you see, Satan came in to try to disrupt the image bearers, image bearers of God. He tried to come in to make the image bearers of God disobey God. How does he tempt them to disobey? He calls into question what God has said. Did God really say this to you? Did God really say this to you? And works to make Eve doubt God's goodness and his truthfulness. You see, after the temptation then comes the fall. This is when the woman saw the fruit of the tree. It was good for food. It was pleasing to the eye. And it was also desirable for gaining wisdom. And so she took some and she ate it. How many times in life have we seen something that looked really good, but there was just that little hesitation, right? How many times have we seen something that looked pleasing? Or how many times have we seen something and it was desirable? Or maybe we made the excuse, hey, this is good for wisdom. I'll become smart. And, and you try to justify what the Lord has already said don't do. I could go there on a couple of different hot topics in today's society, but I refuse to talk about abortion because I don't want somebody thinking I'm getting political. But God, just so you know, and I'm not gonna say this, I'm not gonna talk about this, Pastor Ryan, so make sure you got me on record not talking about this, but God said it would be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck than to do any harm to these little ones. God said, I knew you while you were in your mother's womb but I'm not going to talk about that. And I'm definitely not going to bring up the fact that there are Christian people who feel like that that's an okay practice to operate in abortion. See, I'm not going to talk about that, Pastor Ryan. You need to take notes, son, because you're learning how to pastor a church. These are those taboo conversations, brother, that you do not have. You got what I'm saying? You picking it up? You feeling me on this? All right, good. Because those are the kind of conversations that God says to us, but then we try to get wisdom or we try to grab something, and it's just like what the devil did in the Garden of Eden. Here's this tree. Looked yummy. It was desirable. And you could get wisdom. Okay? You could acquire wisdom. And Eve saw that it was good. And then the Satan came in and he challenged God's word. Friend, let me tell you something this morning. 
do yourself a favor. Don't challenge the word of God. Can I say it one more time? I need a little bit better response. That's a cue for a good amen. Can, I, can you, everybody say amen together with me? Okay, like I heard this section, but I didn't hear this section. So from here over, right, Morgan, wave up high. There you go. From Morgan over, don't say a word. Just this section. Can I hear in the back section? No, not the back section. <laughs> Shh, Keith, do this with me. Shh. Just this section, can I hear amen? amen? Woo, that sounded great. How about this section right here? Just this section. Amen. How about this section? Amen. Can we go back here again? Amen. It was kind of louder in the front than in the back. Go ahead. Amen. Let's this uh, amen. All right, so let's just try this together now in unity. Everybody say amen with me. Amen. Okay. Why was I doing that, Pastor Ryan? <clears throat> you see, here's what happens. The devil tries to bring deceit into your ear after hearing the voice of the Lord. He's been doing it since Eve and Adam, Adam and Eve. So what makes us think, right, that he won't do it to us? So when the Lord says that I'm here, I think that we just need to give him the benefit of the doubt and believe him, right? Believe the voice of the Lord, amen? amen. There you go, I'm getting you trained. Believe the voice of the Lord and, and do what he says to do. Let's not second guess this thing. Let's not, do what, let's not do what Eve did in second guesses. Let's not get deceived with our eyes. Amen? Amen? Let's not get deceived with our eyes, but let's hear the voice of the Lord and let's live by what the voice of the Lord is telling us to do. Now is a good time to say amen. amen. Thank you. Those that God created to trust, to love, and obey him chose to distrust, di distrust and disobey him. We were created to face him. We were created to face God in friendship. But there, here is mankind turning our backs on him in hostility. We were created in the highest positions, but here is where we fell. Let me say this again. All right? We chose to distrust and disobey him. Say those two words real quick together. Distrust and disobey. You know, <clears throat> we're having a lesson at the house. I always like to bring in real life application. Because just, you know, it helps set in a little bit, you know. So we tell one of our children, Preston, I won't mention his name, to do something okay and I'll hear it yeah dad I'll get to it okay now he's 14 right so a few minutes goes by maybe 20 and I'll say hey son yeah dad just give me another minute okay well your 30 minutes your minute is about a 30 minute session but I don't say nothing I don't say nothing hour goes by and I'm like okay son you need to do this right now he's like dad I'll get to it I just got to finish I'm like Okay, here's the bottom line. For an hour, I've told you three different times to do it. Now we're at that point in time where you just get out of your chair and you do it. But dad, uh, psh, no buts. Your minutes have lasted an hour. Your time is up. Now it's time to act. Now it's time to do. You see, through parenthood, we teach our children to obey. Through parenthood, we teach our children. The Bible says, train up a child in the way they should go, and they won't part from it. Amen? So we train our children to obey the voice of the Lord. Look at how the enemy has crept in and destroyed that training in today's society. And why is it? So that we won't know how to hear the voice and obey the voice of the Lord when the Lord God speaks. 
This just goes deeper than biting an apple, friend. This goes to generation after generation after generation. Here's some of the effects, uh, the effects of the fall. <coughs> and although the fall isn't really in the Bible, it helps us as Christians to have and use and to describe this event when Adam and Eve disobeyed and chose to distrust God. Man, disobey and distrust. I don't trust you enough, God. That'd be like my son saying, Dad, I don't trust you enough in this. I'll make my own decision with the table saw. I'm going down to the master power in the basement and killing it, you know. I know what I'm doing with this, Dad. You just can go back in the house. Get a phone call. Dad, I'm using the table saw while my wife and I, he's not really. But just think about that sickening thought. <laughs> dad, I can handle this better than you can. I got this, Dad. I got the saw blade up about four and a half inches out of the well. <sighs> what are you cutting, son? Oh, some balsa wood. That's that distrusting a father. Now, that he never did that with the table saw. Just so you know, he didn't. But going to the extreme, and as silly as that sounds, but yet, friend, when the Lord prompts in your spirit to do something, that's what you're doing. And then there's the effects of the fall. Think about what happened when somebody falls. You watch these little kids fall and they fall down on their booties and they get back up, but try that as an adult. Or you fall down a flight of steps as a little kid. I never did that. <sighs> but you do that as an adult and it's a whole new game changer. Things are going to break. You see, we see that at least three things were broken in the fall. The first thing that was broken in the fall was inside with guilt, shame, and fear. The Bible says, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Think about that. How cool would it be to take a walk in the garden during the cool of the day with God? strolling through the garden. And look at what the enemy did. You see, the enemy created fear in man when they hear God's voice. I heard you and I became fearful for I was naked. I heard you, but I was fearful because I was living in sin. You know what I could preach on that? People that live in sin, they hide themselves from God. They hide themselves, you know why? Because of shame and guilt. You see, when the devil got Eve to bite that apple and then force feed. You heard me. Force feed Adam that apple. No, when Eve bit that apple and she handed it off to Adam and he bit that apple. You see, the devil knew that he was releasing shame and guilt for eternity. He was taking God's perfect creation and he was perverting it. He was distorting it. And you know, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that used to go to church, but they got away from going to church and they began to feel guilty and bad. And you know what they did? They turned their back on God and they walked away. That's why it's hard for somebody that's been serving God all their life. And then for whatever reason, they get distracted by that apple. They get deceived and they bite into that deception. That deception poisons their spirit and kills their spirit. And now they're out there on their own and they are so far away from God. Meanwhile, God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And darkness fills their heart and their life, and they're empty, and they're void of the presence of God Almighty. It's because of that guilt and that shame. I've got to move on. 
The other thing that broke was relationship with God. So the Lord banished him from the Garden of Eden. Can you imagine? You're in the Garden of Eden where you can eat of anything except for that one tree. Everything is around you. My daughter would be in heaven. She'd have all the lions and tigers and bears, oh my. All around her, she would be just all the animals. She would be the animal whisperer of the Garden of Eden. She would love it. She would lay her head down on that big fluffy mane of a lion and go to sleep snuggled up all cozy with all those big animals around her. She would be absolutely in heaven. Can you imagine how Adam felt when he stood outside the Garden of Eden and he said, I remember those days. How about not just I remember those days of life being easy, but I remember those days of walking in the cool of the garden with God. That personal, that intimate relationship with God. You see, when the fall happened, it broke that relationship. It broke it. Now, God is with us, and yes, he's with us, and he sent Holy Spirit. But you got to understand, there was that intimate relationship with God where they walked in the garden, in the cool of the day. How about the third one, the broken relationships with each other? And man said, the woman that you put here with me. She gave me the fruit from the tree. Doesn't take long for Adam to blame the fall on Eve. Before Adam and Eve had a perfect relationship of trust, respect, and love. He even wrote her a love poem. And it says, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. But the fall broke the relationship. For the first time ever, the family that God created was broken and divided. All families can trace their imperfections back to this day. This was the day the solid gift of family was broken into pieces. I firmly believe by this point, Adam and Eve already had a slew of kids. Because it says what it says right here. And the family, the, the most perfect institution God ever created was damaged. And since then, we've had divorce, we've had death, destruction in the family. We have absent fathers in the family. We have absent mothers in the family. I was listening to a congressman talk, and he was talking about the most important thing that this country needs is strong families. I got to move on. It's late. I got to skip this whole section here. But God also promised the Savior. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. As God reveals the curse of Satan will be received from his deception, God inserts the promise of hope. One day, God promised Satan there would come a descendant from Eve who, although, uh-oh, did it again, who, although you will wound him, you'll strike his heel, will crush him. He will crush you forever. Satan may have won the battle over Eve in the garden, but one day Eve's descendant will destroy him. One day God promised Satan's work will be overturned and he will be conquered. And when we look at Revelation chapter 20, it says, And now, <coughs> now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and go out to deceive the nations, which are the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sands of the sea. And they went up uh, on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints 
and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are, and they will be tormented day and night forever. You see, clear back in the Garden of Eden, God addresses Satan and tells him there's going to be a descendant coming from Eve and you'll strike his heel, but he will squash you once and for all. And when the devil stroke his, struck his heel, there's a cross behind the screen. That was when Jesus got nailed to the cross. But you see, when Jesus took the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and he rose from the dead, he said, that's the best you can do. Now let me show you, Satan, what I'm all about. Because there's going to come a day when all your lying, all your thieving, all your stealing, all your deception will come to an end and you're going to be thrown into the lake of fire, you and all your false prophets. You see, friend... Even though there was a fall, we had a loving God who stood by us. Even though there was a fall and there was brokenness, we had a redeeming Jesus Christ come in by our side, grab a hold of us and say, come on, son, it's all right, I got you. Come on, I'm going to wipe your knees off. I'm going to put bandages on you. Get up and get going again because I am the redeemer. I am your hope. I'm the healer and I'm your provider even though Satan tries to come in and rob, steal, and destroy. Look, just because something happened a several thousand years ago, Jesus removed that curse. I'll never forget it. I told this story Wednesday. <laughs> when Peyton was going to be out for me to hold and not just Mama. Tanya's like, you know, I know that God said that woman will be in pain during childbearing years. She said, but I've been asking God to forgive me all of my sins. And she said, and I'm just coming against that curse in Jesus' mighty name. She's like, I'm just coming against it. There will be no pain in childbirth. And you know what? She must have forgot a sin somewhere. <laughs> That's all I can think of. Now, you'd have been struck if I said, and she popped her out with no pain whatsoever and no medication. You'd have been like, really? <laughs> but you know, our God is our Redeemer. God promises and provision to he, God's promise and provision to us is in Jesus. You see, we have a Redeemer through the blood. Isn't it amazing that there had to be blood shed in order for Adam and Eve to be covered in the garden? Now, they took fig leaves and sewed them together. But God actually had to kill one of his creations and, and make clothes, clothes for Adam and Eve. And it isn't amazing that through the shed blood of Jesus Christ that we are covered in him. I'm telling you, friends, I'm telling you, I got to close. 1 John 3, 8 says, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15 says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of the flesh and blood, he himself likewise share, the same, share in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all lifetime subject in bondage. Jesus is also the fulfillment of God's provision. As God sacrificed animals, like I said, to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness in the garden, he sent Jesus to be our sacrifice, that through his blood, our sins can be forgiven. 
our sins will be removed for eternity. John 1.29 says, Jesus, uh, that's John 1.29, Jesus willingly came to die in our place, taking on the punishment for our sins so he could offer us God's forgiveness in life. I'm closing. God created us out of an abundance of love. God created us because he wanted us to freely worship him. God gave us a free will and he wants us to freely worship him. It's no fun if somebody likes you because they have to like you. I have to like you. But it's a lot of fun when you find somebody that truly loves you for who you are and they want to be with you. And when God created us out of his extreme abundance, he said, I've got to give man an ability to freely choose. And that's what he did. And when man freely chose through deception, God said, now I've got to give them a way to be washed and cleansed so that they can enter my presence and we can take those long, cool walks in the Garden of Eden again. This morning, God spoke clearly to me. He said, I am here. I am here. That's that cool walk in the Garden of Eden. It's like, Come on, daughter, take a walk with me and let's talk. I already know what you need, but I just want to hear your voice, sweetheart. I want to hear how your weekend was. Oh, my goodness, when we got her last night, it was like nonstop for two hours. This little girl was cranked tighter than an old watch spring. And we sat and we listened. We watched that cute little face and those expressions. And we, she walked in the back door. She's got her own, <coughs> own horse, I mean dog now. She walked in the back door and said, Pearson, that dog come tearing through the house. She'd go upstairs. That dog was on her heels like water on rice. It was the cutest thing. But just to be in the midst of all that confusion and chaos in my house, I sat there because you know what? I got my daughter with me. And when God says, I am here, this is what he wants. This is what he's after. He knows what you need. He just wants your affection and attention and love. Because let me tell you something. Then there's this thing where ain't nothing going to happen to my little girl because she's mine. That's why we teach courtship because all this has a husband somewhere that if he can duck and outrun my gun, right? No, we're praying for her husband just like we're praying for Preston's wife. In fact, we're fasting and interceding for that woman. <laughs> he got a t-shirt the other day that fits him great. It says, you're thinking it, I just say it. I'm like, what have we created, Tanya? But you see what I'm saying? This is what God, this is the place God wants to be in your life. He wants to be right here and he wants to say, but I've got you. I've got you covered. Nothing coming is going to get through. I'm on your side, and when you're walking, I got your back. I got your six. I got your 12. I got your three. And I got your nine. I got you completely covered. Bethel, let me tell you something right now. I'm going to tell you, Pam, God's got you completely covered. In Jesus' holy name. Not only, you know what his covering is? It was the blood of Jesus. But you know what he's doing? He's walking with you just like this. It doesn't matter what the world is saying. He is walking with you just like this. 
And this morning, that's exactly what the Spirit of the Lord was speaking to this house. Are you willing to accept, embrace, and allow him to walk with you? Don't be like Adam and Eve hiding because they were afraid. You have nothing to be afraid of from him. Let me say that again, right? You have nothing to be afraid of from him at all. Nothing. Paul, you have nothing to be afraid of from him. Mike Duschel, you have nothing to be afraid of from him. Dan and anybody else watching right now, I am telling you right now, you have nothing to be afraid of. It doesn't matter what your life has been like. It doesn't matter what you did last night. It doesn't matter what happened last week. It doesn't matter what's coming against you that doesn't look pretty. Jesus loves you and has a plan for your life and he wants to be right next to, right next to you if you'll let him because you have nothing to fear. You have done nothing that God cannot and will not forgive. He got on the cross and he gave his life just for you so that you could walk in freedom. Allow him to take this place with you. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? That's what we get on Wednesday nights in here. This coming Wednesday, we're in Genesis 4, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. God is just and God is merciful. So if you want to hear more, we'll see you Wednesday at 7. And youth, same thing. Amen? Bethel, God is here. He is with you. Surrender. Father, I just thank you for your word this morning. Lord, as we close, Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll just continue to speak life into our hearts and our spirits, God. And Father, in this we do, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' holy name. Amen.